Hello, welcome to Dad and Daughters D&D. I'm Dad, you can call me Drake. And today we're going to continue with the Mist of Change campaign story. So in part three, we talked about how they had met Timothy Sabin, the Archmage of the Platinum City, how they had discussed with him their findings and he had discussed with them what they knew. But one of the things we left out was what did they learn from Vixen when they contacted her as they summoned the goddess? Well, one of the things they learned is that the mist is actually a creation of a device within the mist marsh and that the master of the castle in the mist marsh no longer has control of it and someone else is now trying to gain control of it um, since it's the first time it was disturbed many many years ago and that they will need to locate and find um, someone who can actually gain control of this device however they are informed that no one actually still exists that can access the device. Um, they were told Lord Glaive, which is a very, very, very old vampire, was once um, was sired by the creator of this device, but due to treacherous actions has been literally cut off from it. He has no way to access um, this castle or the device. The only other vampire that was sired, however, no longer exists, but still lives. That got the group confused. So, naturally, on their trip to the Crystal City, the group is trying to relay this to Tim, and they also relay it to Zex. Um, Zex gets really apprehensive, really shuts down over this. Um, Tim does mention he has heard rumors of a castle out in the mist. A few people have even cited it, though there's never been any activity around it or in it in any of the records. Um, and as often as it does pop up in history, um, no one actually knows how old it is. So as far as the information they're getting, they are seeing a potential to what they're getting being accurate. And they have also been told that something to do um, with a ritual um, actually is what got rid of this final vampire and that that vampire um, still alive even though not in Azeroth but yeah they're confused it is at this point where they tell um, or when the Zex or the bloody count informs them that um, he was there when that ritual was done. He is fully aware of what happened. He was there when that vampire ceased to exist. And he's not sure if that vampire can be restored even though it's still alive. Um, and he does not understand the ritual, nor does he understand what went wrong back then. So here the group goes now into the Crystal City. They land. Tim gives them some items to help them. He gives them a glass orb that they can shatter that will take them straight to the Platinum City. Yay! Um, when they're ready to go home and report back to the Platinum City after they finish their business in the Crystal City. He also gives them a bosun whistle in case something goes wrong and they need to travel quickly. He doesn't tell them what that means. He just gives them that bosun's whistle. Um, what can I say? This little mage has a tendency to give items and not tell you what they do. They head into the Crystal City. The first thing they do is encounter um, one of the generals of the city. He's already outside talking with a very old captain, a sea captain. Grizzly, unkept beard, large hat, very, very weathered skin. Looks like he's been on the sea for years. Um, dressed in very dull grays. Just very, very common garb for um, not very expensive in any way. And he is awaiting a seat, an ability to meet with. And I have a few notes here to keep me on pace. 
He is waiting to meet with the High Court of Elders of the Crystal City, which, lo and behold, that's the same group that the, our adventurers are wanting to actually meet with. It is actually at this time where the court demands to know the name of the group they're meeting with. Our group now actually has to officially name themselves, and they have, they're, they, they're, they're, they're crap at asking for names. They never ask a person's name, so when it comes to giving information to other people that they've gathered, they don't even know how to tell them who told them what. Um, and because of this, and I think I've used this term a few times already, but the group officially dubs their adventuring party the Nameless Wanderers because they can't think of a name and they never ask for names. So they're wandering around on Azeroth with no names. They're the Nameless Wanderers. Um, and it takes um, a little bit of information. The, the general's asking them what they're here to tell them. And they pitch this entire um, ancient vampire concept, this entire mist machine concept. And the fact that it all happened because the ritual that was done here got messed up. Elves are prideful. They have some pride. And it's very well known that the council is full of people that are um, a little stuck up. And they're planning on marching in there and telling them they done messed up. This is your fault. We're here to fix it. It is at this point the captain um, actually tells them, you know what? I have an appointment here in five minutes. Um, you can have my spot. This captain introduces himself as Captain Farnor. And informs them he has been bringing cargo into the Crystal City and that his ship is one of the few ships that's been able to make it in in recent times. And because of this, he is trying to find out more information to potentially open up shipping lanes and help the Crystal City out. And that's why he was wanting to talk with them. But he absolutely insists on giving his appointment to the Nameless Wanderers because in his mind, he wants to see the council react to this nonsense. So they head in and they um, deliver this information to the council or to the High Court of Elders. Um, the head of the High Court is unpressed, unimpressed to say the least. In fact, upon mentioning the name of the bloody count, um, he accuses them of trusting a murderer over um, the people of the Crystal City. And it just kind of escalates from there. So every time he asks for proof, they're like, well, we don't have any. Okay, well, where did you get this? Well, we don't know the person's name. Okay, well, where did you get this piece of information? Um, a random voice in our head. Okay, where did you get the information about this ancient vampire? A goddess told us. Now, let's be honest. Even the most rational good meaning person who is listening to this is actually going to start wondering what the hell these people are crazy and to be fair that would be reasonable but this guy's belligerent to the point and but he's still required to follow procedure and all the other court elders are sitting there listening to this as well and as they look around, most of these elders, they're kind of shifting in their seats. They don't really know what to make of this. None of it makes sense at all. So the high court adjourns um, to deliberate and talk this over overnight and to vote and see what the fate of the nameless wanderers are because they are trying to gain access to a very, very old library at the Crystal City in hopes to find more information on all these topics. And it is, it's not a public library. It's one that they're going to have to gain access to. And this court of elders is going to have to be the ones that give them access. So they leave that meeting it a little deflated. As they leave the chambers, though, um, they find a place to stay for the night and get some quarters and everything. When they are approached by one of the members of the 
um, court of elders that they saw in the chambers. She has come out to talk with them. And this is Nashala Zelran. Um, she is one of the high mages of the Crystal City and an active member on the high court. The reason she has come to talk with them is she wanted to point out that she does not necessarily agree with what the current um, figurehead was saying because they rotate who's um, head of the elder court quite regularly so that matters are balanced out. They just happened to come in on the worst day when that grumpy guy was there. She actually informs them that her mother actually found a baby after the fall of Valentina centuries ago, back at the what under the current cap modern calendar for Azeroth would be year zero. That's like two thousand years ago. Elves live a while, and that that child would grow up learn about his family, learn about his home, learn about what happened, and would train in the combat arts, more specifically the art of swordsmanship with her father. And according to her parents and the tales that she has been told, that individual would go on to lead a crusade against the undead and the vampire that actually laid waste to the kingdom of Valentina. She also informed them that that child would quickly earn the title of the Bloody Count. So this individual they saw recently, who has such a brutal reputation, apparently is older than they thought he was and is possibly 2,000 years old. He's wandering these wilds. They know he has a connection to Valentina. They now think the Bloody Count is the vampire they're looking for and that somehow or another, he's not a vampire, but he's not aging either. Something's wrong here. Um, Nashala quickly points out to them, no, there was another. There was another. The vampire that sacked the Old Kingdom was tracked down by the Bloody Count and the Bloody Count sought to destroy this vampire However, after finding the identity of the vampire, besieged the elder court as well as the other races in order to help finally put an end to it all once and for all by essentially curing this vampire of its vampirism and restoring it to the life it once knew so that it could make good on its crimes. But beyond that, the entire details of it she didn't know, but she wanted to know. She had an interest. But she had another problem, and she wanted to um, see if she could get their help on that as well. So she takes them over to what is known as the Emerald Garden in the Crystal City. It's this beautiful garden of inlaid emerald and metal craftsmanship. Um, to the point where even the high elves themselves admire the craftsmanship and it's not crafted by elven hands she points out to them but the craftsmen of the emerald garden went missing no one was really sure what happened to them and she enjoyed the artwork and she always enjoys puzzles so she was doing her own investigations to try and find out what had happened and she found out that the craftsmen were possibly once um members of what is was an unknown grouping of forest gnomes that lives outside the crystal city they had remained unnoticed for a very very long time and one of these dwellings was completely abandoned a beautiful dwelling she even escorts the group there shows them how to enter it they go down under the ground through this the tree roots basing into this beautiful simple home but the woodworking the engraving the artistry is gorgeous and they do see a lot of the golds and silvers and definitely those emerald inlays but further back you go you realize the lighting of this house is actually built so that light from the pond outside is coming straight down and you're able to look up into this pond all she has found that has given her any information was the name Emerald Heart. 
Um, she has spoken with the forest gnomes. They know that there was indeed a emerald heart that was banished from the area because of tensions with the elves. However, the rest of the Emerald Heart family, no one's really sure where they went, what happened to them. They just kind of up and disappeared several years after the um, youngest Emerald Heart was ran out of town by the elves. But she did find a tome that was being put together and built. Very well-made tome, and it had similar artistry, but it was incomplete. Um, and it did have a name in it, and she was trying to find out more about this. They tell her that it might be reasonable for them to look up Timothy Sabin of the Platinum City. He's a forest gnome who lives out in the Platinum City. And they've asked him a little bit about himself. He doesn't really say where he comes from, where his home was. No one seems to know. But he did make a comment about learning magic through trial and forest fire. And that upset the neighbors. Not a lot to go on, but for their help, Nishala thanks them. And she assures them that she's going to do everything she can to help them in return. So, after a night of drinks, food, and pastries, and cake, which, by the way, they, shall, they shared pastries and cake with the guards, um, to the um, elder chambers, where the library was also kept, the next morning came and they quickly worked their way over to the court. Um, before they even got in, the Shala met them at the door. And when they walked in, it was decided they will be allowed access to the library, but they will be under escort the whole time. And the escort will be responsible for their actions. The escort they have been assigned will be Nashala. So they're sitting there asking about how we get into the library. And she's like, well, that's the beauty about the library. It has no entrance. There's only one way in and only a court member can get you in. And she slams her staff to the floor of the um, chambers. They're immediately in this massive library which, looking out the windows, they realize they're not in Kansas anymore. They're not sure this library even actually is on Azeroth. It's weird. So they begin doing their research to find out more of what they can. Doing the research, hey, our bard manages to find a bunch of locations dealing with the Fae, and that if she was able to potentially use something to break a curse in one of these areas, that is very, very, very close to the Fey Wild to the point where you could almost trip and fall in, she would be able to break the curse. Now, at this point in time, the spell, they ain't got it. But she goes ahead and she tries to record all these different locations that are known to be areas close to the Fey Wilds where that barrier between the realms is so thin. And the group agrees that once they get the spell and everything, the group is going to travel to one of these locations and try to help our bard, um, you, to break her curse. Because again, remember, every morning that poor bard's waking up as someone different. She has no control over what she looks like, her personality, and all this. She does remember who she is, but the shape she assumes also changes her personality and her actions. They also find out more about this ritual, and it is recorded, and it is made very clear, yes, this ritual went wrong. Something happened, and one of the recordings was talking about the ritual itself. There was a vessel that was required to house and contain the vampiric essence of the individual, and the vessel was extremely hard to craft. They had to employ both clans of dwarves, including um, as well as the gnomes and to manage the magic to balance it out to channel it they needed the blood of the great dragons and they needed several doses of this um three doses in fact just to power the ritual well now they got a problem because they don't know where to find no great dragons again these great dragons they make ancient dragons look like puppy dogs and 
they don't know where to find them. Many people think they're a myth. Um, so they got a whole new problem here. But they do know the vessel was supposed to have been delivered to the Elven City. And the, they're showing a, a contradiction, however, because the vessel in the description is not the vessel that is described to have been crafted. As they're researching, though, suddenly Captain Farnor just walks right by. No escort, no nothing, just walks right by. Even the shawl is surprised and approaches him and confronts him. How did you gain access? You're not allowed to be here. He just gives her this kind of sly smile and a wink and goes on about his business. And it's just like Nishala completely forgets he's there. After the research... The group goes back down, informs a few members of the council what they have found. One of the members, as a historian, takes them to a place where the vessel they're describing is still housed. And when they find it, there is sure enough a massive crack running all the way down it. The materials don't match, nor does the artistry. And comparing the notations, comparing the vessels and um, the works, this elder is convinced the elves of that age, in their pride, they may have switched the vessel thinking they could build a better vessel than the dwarves. But if that's the case, they still need to find the vessel. The vessel's still missing, and they still need to know all the parts of the ritual, because all parts of this ritual were written and composed in at least four different manners. Not only were was the other races... Um, utilized to help build the vessel. Um, gnomish mages composed part of the ritual. Dwarves of the Battlesmiths composed part of the ritual. Dwarves of the Flamebeards composed part of the ritual. Um, and the Elves composed part of the ritual. So this is a ritual that literally has layers and layers upon layers that they're going to need every section of this before they're going to have any chance of doing it. That's if they decide they truly want to try and resurrect an ancient vampire <clears throat> to shut down this mist machine. Because right now, everybody's trying to weigh the difference. What's more dangerous, an ancient vampire that conquered in one of the strongest kingdoms of its time, or mist? Granted, the mist is ramping up. They're fully aware that it's maybe yet at 8% 8, 8 of its actual ability. And they know it actually summoned a Tarrasque at one point. So, yeah, the group's pretty sure the vampire might be the better um, solution, at least from their perspective at this point. And, of course, they got their little orb to go back to the Platinum City. The group, however, is like, we got to talk to these gnomes. The gnomes know something. we got to find a way to get to the gnomes. And they're outside now talking to Nashala talking about the gnomes and Captain Farnor informs them that's okay um, you are more than welcome to um, take a trip on my ship interestingly enough when they're like how much will it cost somehow or another the, he informs them that the cost has already been paid don't worry about it there's no cost you're good your, your trip's covered. Um, now, they're suspecting Hondo of having prepaid this trip. And Hondo being the leader of the Thieves Guild, who has already contacted um, the rogue in the group a time or two. He, her antics have gotten his attention. She's not a member of the Guild, but her antics have gotten his attention. So... They decided, well, we wanted to go there. We already have a ship. Let's go. Well, the problem is the waters out of the Crystal City are 100% blockaded by the Pirate Queen of Azeroth, Renmora. And that blockade is why the elves are having trouble getting supplies in. And Far Farnor is one of the few ships that's been able to get supplies in and out. But to get out, he's going to have to run that blockade. And he informs them of this and the dangers. They're willing to take the risk. They're willing to give it a try. So our group boards Farnor's ship, the Fate Weaver, and disembark from Crystal City to Dark Haven. 
in order to find the gnomes. Now, they are aware that Darkhaven is a cold, cold landscape. They did think ahead. They purchased them some winter gear so that they can be warm. But they also know that they're going to have to traverse up a very high altitude mountain to get to the gnomes. And that this mountain is enveloped in a blizzard all the time. And the higher up you go, the harder it gets and the more dangerous the monsters on the mountain are. It's recommended they get a guide. So they're very focused on this mountain and how they're going to overcome this. When the actual, when the totality of the blockade hits them, there is a massive stretch of water in the bay of the Crystal City. There is enough ships to completely blockade it side to side, letting nothing in and out. They're going to have to charge this blockade and fight their way through it or try to sneak through it. And it's probably a hundred ships to their one. But they do see in the horizon just one black line of ships blocking them in. The group knows that's going to be the challenge that they're going to have to overcome. They're already on the boat. And to top it off, they're going to have to, once they get through the blockade, they're going to have to cross um, an expanse of the dark seas, which is just a massive amount of ocean with no land at all in it, heading north. And with no land, no markers, no nothing, getting lost is easy. And that's also where your big nasties in the ocean tend to reside. So they're getting nervous. And it's right there on that nervous point, that point of what are we going to do, that this particular session and summary came to a close. Hope you've enjoyed this summary and this section of the Mist of Change campaign. Next week, in the next summary, we're going to discuss what happens with that blockade. And we'll see how far up that mountain we get. I'm Drake. This has been Dad and Daughters D&D. I'll see you in game and have some fun. Take care. Bye-bye.